John, you've got so much content online that I don't think anybody needs to ask you for a definition of the meaning crisis. However, I'm going to allow you to do that for me. But I would like the majority of this conversation to be on consciousness and the mind-body problem. As you know, this sure. podcast is called Mind-Body Solution, paying homage to the infamous problem. And I think it was episode 10 in your lecture series where you focused on this um, quite significantly. And it's obviously, it, it's a theme throughout. But give me your definition of consciousness and, and also your understanding of the mind-body problem. So... Um... I don't know if I have a definition. I think of consciousness in terms of three problems. Two are um, sort of what I would regard as de uh, defining problems, even though I can't give you a definition. And then there's a meta problem between the two problems. Uh, first is the nature question, which is how is something like consciousness, which seems do not have any of the properties of all the things we seem to bump in in the universe. How is something like consciousness, how do, can it exist in this universe? Um, and, um, and there's various answers to that. Uh, and, and overlapping with that is how could it causally interact with the physical universe? So that's the nature question. Um, the fun function question is, given that so very much of our sophisticated, intelligent, complex behavior goes on without consciousness, what is consciousness's function? What does consciousness function to do? Uh, so this is the nature problem and the function problem. And then the meta question is, um, how are these two questions related? Yeah. Uh, should they be answered independently or should they be answered interdependently? And should you start from function and go to nature or start from nature and go to function, et cetera? And I would propose to you that the definitions of consciousness come out of answering those three definitional defining questions i would put yeah. it and so i think I, I to claim that there's a definition of consciousness right now would be pretentious i do think i could make a strong argument that all attempts uh to define consciousness should address these three defining questions and we could perhaps evaluate attempts to define consciousness in terms of how well they address these three questions. Yes. And as a philosophical history of the mind-body problem, what have been the key takeaways throughout the years of philosophy that we have access to um, that you've noticed have been fundamental into framing this problem for you? So what's fundamental is um, I think we have forgotten that our current epistemological or even onto-epistemological framework um, what my friend Greg Enriquez calls the Enlightenment Gap, and he and I are writing a book on consciousness together right now. Nice. Um, um, uh, uh, we we forget that that is actually a historical invention that came out uh, through the Enlightenment, in which we think the world is exclusively dichotomized into a inner subjective realm and an outer objective realm, and this is grounded in a substance ontology, in which there. Reality is ultimately grounded in sort of th things, uh, spatial temporal things uh, that can exist to some degree of significant independence. And when we, what substance is from the inside is subjectivity, what it is from the outside is objectivity. And the thing to remember is, of course, that way of carving up the world is not by any means universal. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not even uh, universal in our own history. You go before the Cartesian Revolution, you have, you know, in the Middle Ages, something like a heliomorphism, although there's a lot of Neoplatonism in there. You go back earlier um, and you have a Neoplatonic framework in which the problem isn't between the subjective and the objective. The crucial problem they're wrestling with is the problem of the one and the many. How can being be simultaneously one and many? And then they try to unpack um, the nature of cognition, the nature of knowing, and the nature of experience within trying to address that question. And we sort of do the reverse. Um, and we think that is um, how it has to be. Um, and then, of course, part and parcel of that is Descartes also gave us not only that dichotomy and competing notions of real. We have these two competing notions of what realness is. One is sort of mathematically measurable, and the other one is most subjectively experienced. So, of course, the cogito, I 
I am that I, you know, I, I think therefore I am versus the mathematical measurements of matter, et cetera. Um, but in addition to that, Descartes gave us the proposal. He actually, Hobbes has it too, and, but Descartes, and so Descartes and Hobbes together, uh, that cognition is computation. And then Hobbes, of course, uh, came up with that idea with the idea, well, we could get a completely automatic material machine that could compute, and then that would give us cognition, mind. Um, he didn't say much about consciousness, but I assumed uh, many people have gone on to think, well, maybe if we get artificial intelligence, and many people are talking this way right now with the LLMs, then we'll just get uh, consciousness coming along for the ride. So, sorry, that was a, a bit of a speech, but that's sort of uh, the grammar, the cultural cognitive grammar within which I think we're working. John, ne never apologize for going off. Uh, I I'm here to listen. <laughs> so <laughs> I, the, the questions are just there for you to express yourself. But I was speaking to Michael Evan two days ago. It was excellent think, person to speak to. Excellent yeah, okay, person. With our third conversation, <laughs> we, we had postponed one of our previous ones. And luckily, prior to that, he just published one of his papers on, on AI. And you were acknowledged as one of the people he'd spoken to in that paper, just yes. by. Um, the one on self-improvising memory. But we were discussing the fact that we we put so much emphasis on AI and, and consciousness, not not really considering the ethical implications of of what he calls synthbiosis. Um, yes. How are we going to get together and, and form these cohesive units with the LLMs or the robotics that come with it? And then again, with that, it's it's quite difficult to distinctly draw lines between what is conscious, what isn't. Yes. Where do you find yourself on the spectrum? Do you see this thing as a continuum or or are you finding this to be quite difficult to even say is a Um so um uh, uh, my, what what I argue for I want to be really careful here because this is like next to god this is the hardest philosophical problem I think. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so I do not want to come off as pretentious. I'm answering your questions as honestly as I can, mm -hmm. given the best arguments I have formulated in terms of looking at other people's arguments and evidence. And I want it understood that is that is my stance. Now, John Verveke is not pronouncing on this phenomenon. Um, <laughs> I hope it doesn't come off that way, because that is not my intent. Um, for me, I, I, I side with Michael. Uh, well, I converge with Michael. We only recently uh, met each other and found how convergent our work is. I think... Um, you can answer the nature and function questions together in an interdependent fashion uh, by seeing how they both are explainable in terms of relevance realization. Mm -hmm. And then I think relevance realization is ultimately grounded in autopoiesis. Uh, and um, I think that means that general intelligence, general artificial intelligence requires something like artificial autopoiesis to ground it. And Michael has a, a view very similar to that. And there's deep reasons for that. This is, I think, how you get a, a lot of the central properties you need for uh, bona fide uh, intelligent cognition. And then I happen to argue that I think the function of uh, consciousness is to give us a higher order recursive correction on our relevance realization machinery, basically going on in uh, working memory. And that is an enhancement uh, uh, of our intelligence uh, so that it's sort of bootstrapping it up so that it can deal with current problems that are high in novelty, high in complexity, and high in ill-definedness. And this comes from the work of Bohr and Seth and Il Seth, of course, who just ha had a book out on consciousness as well, that we seem to be able to make things automatic and not requiring consciousness when these properties are lacking uh, for us, a problem is not in the world or in you, it's between you and the world, right? Um, and so when uh, we can then ask, well, it seems to be we need consciousness when these properties are the case. And then I would argue those are just, ex those are uh, sort of extreme, the extreme pole of the whole relevance realization that intelligence is facing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think... Um, Consciousness, therefore, shades off as we start to um, move down our own cognition or move back through species, where I'm using back in a very metaphorical sense. I don't think evolution is teleological or anything like that. And where we say, like, as a worm, does a worm have intelligence and a worm have consciousness? 
And I point out to you that um, part of my, one of the advantages of my proposal, not an argument for it, but one of the powers of it is that it, it tends to explain why we carry this very deep intuition that we attribute consciousness to the degree and wherever we find intelligence. Um, and so typically the things that people doubt are conscious are things they equally doubt are intelligent. Um, True. and so I, like Michael, I think cognition shades down and intelligence shades down. And so consciousness shades down. I, that does not make me a pan psychic, maybe in a really, really weak way, uh, you know, something like a really watered down version of Whitehead's pan experientialism. I'm not sure about that, but I do think you, you drop because you drop out of relevance realization into just, um, sorry, I want to be very careful. Relevance realization and autopoiesis need each other. They're bound together, but you can drop below autopoiesis into merely self-organizing systems. And then I doubt that they have intelligence, even though there's a continuity between those self-organizing systems and autopoetic conscious agents. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, all of these, these answers are going to be all complex because again, other than God, this is the hardest problem. <laughs> the, the the more complex, the better. In When you in your work, in your particularly on consciousness, ontonormativity seems to play a very central yep. role. Yep. Uh, let's go through that. What that is for those who don't know, and and how it relates to higher conscious, uh, higher states of consciousness. Sorry, and and just yep. elaborate on on the, how these states challenge our understanding of reality. Yes. So that's um, that's there's sort of a two part argument to that. The first part of the argument is largely based on the work of Yadin. He's done a lot of work on the noetic um, aspect or the noetic quality of uh, transcendent experiences, mystical experiences, transformative experiences. We're playing around with the language right here. Um, um, and, and that's because, again, we're moving into territory with where our normal Cartesian cognitive grammar doesn't help us very much. For Descartes, there's a monadic substantial self and there's a monophasic state of consciousness and there is one way to reason which is computation so it's all very very like it's a it's it's a very monadic understanding and we're breaking out of that yes. um so yaden's notion is i called it ontonormativity he doesn't call it this um but when you when you study people who have these very powerful experiences. So let me be a little bit more precise in how I'm using the term. People have a mystical experience where they have an experience of profound oneness, uh, a, a tremendous sense of um, insight, even though it's uh, ineffable. Um, and if there's a, and there's often another quality, and this is the quality that often pushes it into a transformative experience. And this is they experience it as really real. Yes. Now, this is what's paradoxical about these states. Normally, we judge the real. Real is a comparative term, and I want people to remember that. So real is an actual predicate, unlike existence, which is problematic and Kant and Kant and Kant. Okay, so putting all that aside, but real is a predicate because it's a comparative relation. And we always compare one thing to another uh, mm -hmm. when we're making a judgment of realness. And so what's going on is normally we look at sort of the coherent intelligibility of our waking life in our normal state of consciousness that allows us consensual communication with other human beings. And we go, that's real. And anything that deviates from that, like a dream, we compare it to that and go, no, it's lacking a lot of the properties of this, and therefore that's not real. Now, what's weird about this altered state of consciousness is it does exactly the opposite. People go into this, which is very unlike very unlike their everyday consensual experience. They can't give it any conceptual content whatsoever. And yet they say, that's more real mm -hmm. than this. That and is then it leads to that's onto normativity. That's the onto part, the more real, the more being. And the normative part is it becomes a transformative experience. They start to transform their lives, their relationships, sometimes their occupation of vocations, their very identity, because they want to be in closer contact and conformity to that ontonormativity. Which, uh, that's the part I find very fascinating, because in my work, as a, as a doctor and someone who, who did my dissertation in the philosophy and ethics of mental health, this, this, there's an almost, it's inescapable to 
to think of the mind-body problem and just completely be oblivious to the moral philosophy that comes out with whatever answer we provide to this, whatever solution we give, because these are fundamentally linked to things. The moment we provide a substantial um, claim for what consciousness is, we're automatically putting ourselves in some sort of a moral philosophical position. Because if, if someone says that, let's say consciousness is a product of the brain, then obviously we adjust laws according to brain injuries and, and how we're going to dig, how does someone look at someone's reality based on what they do and the moral implications of their behavior. If it's about the electromagnetic field, we have to look at those correlates. So it becomes quite fascinating because then you've got idealist views, panpsychist views. This changes this moral landscape so much. Yeah. The discussion just becomes quite difficult to have. What have been your thoughts on this over time? I'm glad you brought that up because, and, and, and this point right here. Um, so, I mean, I think the moral question should be raised. I would, I would modify it in that we shouldn't only look at moral issues in which we um, might cause harm. Yes, yes. <clears throat> we also need moral questions in which we might prevent growth. Yeah. Right? Because those are also morally important. And so for me, the theory that I've been working out with uh, with other people, especially uh, with Greg Enriquez, uh, uh, the relevance realization, the recursive relevance realization theory, um, has the has a power. Again, you you give independent arguments for it, and then you say, does it have new explanatory powers? Yeah. So there's not an argument for it. This is an argument for if it's true, this is something it could help to explain. We could get into why I might think it's true later. But uh, if you think of this, and then and if you think about what's being altered in these altered states of consciousness, is sort of the, our fundamental framing of reality, the, our fundamental relevance realization machinery, and this this involves us, or the, the kind of age, or the way our agency is shaped to fit the world or not. Then you have the possibility that these altered states of consciousness can do, or could well, I'll be more careful, can afford what many traditions claim, namely the in cultivation of wisdom. It's like in a Cartesian framework, why would going temporarily sort of insane in any way uh, enhance your capacity for wisdom? But if you think that what consciousness is doing is helping us enhance our relevance realization to deal with ill-definedness, complexity, and novelty, well, it might be that if we enhance that in the right way, we get what wise people have. They have a potential, a power to go into complex situations that are ill-defined for most of us, have a high degree of uncertainty or novelty in them, and they zero in on what's relevant. And we go, wow, that, and they shape themselves to fit it well. And we go, oh, that's a wise person. And then we think, oh, this is how altering states of consciousness in a disciplined manner could potentially enhance wisdom. And it could potentially lead to states in which people get a kind of systemic insight into their world and a right uh, sorry a systematic insight into their world and a systemic insight into their own processing and that could be you know th this sense of seeing more deeply into our reality and so i think that the moral question is if we understand consciousness as enhanced recursively enhanced relevance realization that refits us and affords a capacity for zeroing in on what's relevant in a more insightful and comprehensive manner, um, I think that means that we now have to consider the fact that a monophasic morality around consciousness should be morally challenged because mm -hmm. by saying that people, that's the norm that people should hold themselves to, they are preventing access to altered states that could actually afford uh, tremendous growth. And of course, the point of this argument in, in terms of current pertinence is this lines up with what's happening with the psychedelic renaissance and a lot of the research going into psychedelic yes. and mystical experience. And uh, along those lines, what, what are your thoughts on this? In, in terms of the psychological renaissance, which aspects of it do you find most particularly exciting and which ones do you find particularly concerning? I'll start with the second first. Uh, so what I find most particularly upsetting is that people are still talking about these experiences within the framework that I'm proposing we need to call into question, namely a sort of uh, Cartesian single substance, single state. Um, and 
they're doing a kind of romantic response to it as if all psychedelic states are somehow intrinsically good or valuable and it's just having having that state you know, like like sort of having uh, i don't know a chocolate bar you know possession of some property is sufficient for all the goodness that will come out of it and i think that's a ridiculous proposal i think it reframes things exactly the wrong way i think we should be asking which of these states and how of those states we determine um are are you know can make us wiser and which one of them may actually um hijack our cognitive processes and conduce us to being more self-deceptive and foolish. We've all met people, at least I, because of the circles I move in, who's had one of these experiences and goes down a whore. Oh, they don't get addicted. Yes, they don't. They don't get addicted in the medical sense, but they get, a, they get metaphysically addicted to a rabbit hole metaphysics that keeps them on the vet, on the, almost on the edge of insanity. Yeah. And it's like, no, we we have to set up a sapiential framework. A fra people should be only undertaking, and I would even say studying these states within an ecology of practices that is dedicated towards overcoming self-deception, enhancing relevance realization, getting you better at being more self-reflectively critical, get, making you better at you know uh, 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 calling in what in proper wonder your agency and identity into question, all of that sort of stuff that the traditions emphasize. So that's the second point. What's exciting about this is I, I do think we are opening up to the possibility of non-inferential propositional <clears throat> processes being actually central uh, to how human beings uh, can come into a deeper relationship and a more meaningful relationship to themselves, other people in the world. And I think that's important uh, that there, we're starting to realize that, that there are ways that don't load on inference, ways that instead load on insight that are important for human flourishing. Um, and so that's what I think is exciting about these. Well, John, when you say inference instead of insight, do you find that these two concepts are are not linked in any way or like do you, do you not see insight insightful information as sort of inferences in themselves so what i would say is i i think it's the case that both insight and inference are common descendants of general intelligence and the empirical literature will back me on that mm -hmm. uh and uh but and i my explanation for that would be because they're both relying they both presuppose uh what i what i argue general uh general intelligence is, which is relevance realization. Um, but um, they're, they're at best only correlated at about 0.4 with each other. And there's, all, there's other measures where they're correlated less, um, and they seem to work in fundamentally different ways. And this is an ongoing debate, and I, I teach on this at the University of Toronto, between what's called the special process view of insight, that insight is a different kind of process, mm. um, and the business as usual perspective, which is insight is just sort of um, a, a special instance of more general inferential processes. And I happen to think, um, while they often are interpenetrating, I do think they operate in fundamentally different ways mm. um, and are different processes. And things that seem to be central to insight would seem to, seem to be deeply out of place in inference. For example, and this is something that's convergent between machine learning and psychology. Dumping, and this, by the way, it's also jives with the psychedelic stuff, dumping noise into your neural network, like static mm. noise, meaningless you know, just can often provoke an insight because it breaks you up from uh, overfitting to the data. Uh, it, it allows you to open up your state space, et cetera, et cetera. That's a non-inferential relation. There's no propositional representation. There's no inferential relation between them. What you're doing is you're, ba you're basically breaking up framing and then you're relying on self-organizing processes to re-self-organize uh, and that's what an insight is. And you wouldn't want to do that in your inferential processes. You wouldn't want to be throwing in irrelevant propositions and noise into your argumentative structure. That's exactly what you're trying to prevent. Um, and, and I have more arguments like that. I'm just trying to give the listeners a, sort of an intuitive grasp of why you might think, why it's reasonable to think these two processes are different. And notice what you do is we, we have different rationality 
practices or maybe reasonableness practices in which we, we, so for example, in mindfulness, you try to shut off the inferential machinery, my, meditation, in order to enhance the insight machinery. When you're doing something like active open-mindedness, you try to clamp down on the insight machinery because you don't want to jump to conclusions, right? And so you want an opponent, pro I would argue, you want an opponent processing between them. Yes. Along those lines, one of my questions that, have, um, that I actually prepared for you was, um, what is the role of introspection within the study of consciousness, in your opinion? I think this would tie in perfectly with this insight, inferential aspect. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so I, I want to broaden it in, in a couple of ways. First of all, I, I, I think that unreflective introspection is like another species of common sense and common sense, um, is common sense actually runs off the obviousness generated by a relevance realization. And then therefore is no place to begin the, the explanation of how your brain generates mm -hmm. the sense of obviousness. And I think that is the same case with your introspection. Uh, that common sense is also deeply inflected, infected, if you'll allow me to be a little bit more harsh, by our cultural cognitive grammars. People introspect. Well, it's in here. What? Aristotle thought it was in your heart. The, the Egyptians thought it's in your liver. You're just acting out a cultural metaphor. You don't literally think there's a literal space inside your head that you're going into. That's crazy. Um, and, and so it's like, okay, that's why... So untutored introspection, I'm hesitant about. Phenomenological reflection in which people have um, tremendous practice around taking the reflective stance that the phenomenological tradition teaches and methods for doing that, allied with the methodological and disciplined altering of states of consciousness. So we don't, when we introspect, we don't just think, oh, that's it, that one internal state is... So you want you want you want a phenomenologically trained introspection. You want it expanded by disciplined mindfulness practices to include many kinds of uh, uh, states of consciousness. And then you want to broaden your introspection so it overlaps and integrates with your interoception, that internal that sense you have of what's going on inside your body. That you I can ask you to do right now when I ask you how's your uh, how's your right big toe doing? Oh yeah, it's okay. That. Yeah. Um, um, so the the more embodied aspect and whether or not introspection and introception are on a continuum or two different things, I tend to think they're on a continuum because I think cognition is embodied. But the point is, these are the ways we have to really broaden that. Once you do all of that, I think that the first person perspective has to be included um, in any attempt to understand cognition but we have to include all the perspectives uh, uh, we have to include the first person the third person and the second person perspectives if we're going to try and get a grip on what consciousness is i would argue in line with those first person subjective phenomenological experiences do you, do you think that cognitive science in general or let's just say general neuroscience philosophy, et cetera, just does not have enough of a focus on phenomenology. Um, I mean, for example, there's a whole field called phenomenological psychopathology. They work on the Carl Jaspers, Heidegger. Do you feel it's 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 too ignored perhaps and perhaps needs a little bit more sh light shone on it? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, um, I, I consider myself a member of a member in good standing um, of what's called 4E Cogsci with other people like my friend and uh, colleague, Evan Thompson, um, uh, Mark Miller, uh, uh, you know, just just uh, Andy Clark, uh, just to name a, a whole bunch of people. And there's a lot more, uh, you know. Um, so. Hasn't Andy, hasn't Andy added an extra E to that? I think it's not. He's got He's got a fifth E to it. I can't remember what it was called. Oh well, I've proposed I've proposed adding two more E's. <laughs> okay, what uh, are your two extra E's? Emotion. Well, just give all four in case some of the people don't. Okay. Know. Yeah, yeah. So cognition is inherently embodied. There's no such thing as disembodied uh, cognition. Your body is not some sort of Cartesian clay or vehicle that your mind is just driving around. Your body is a constitutive, functioning system for you being an intelligent, conscious agent. Um, 
cognition is enacted. So it's much more, you sh the metaphor we should use is not that cognition is inside your head, but that cognition and consciousness are between you and the world, interacting with each other, how you're coupled together. Related to that is embedded. Your cognition is embedded. It's grounded in your biology, which is grounded in your ecology and your cultural history. Mm -hmm. And then it's extended. Most of your cognition is not done as an individual. You, What you do is you interface, and I'm using uh, network, you know, uh, you know, like the internet metaphor. Look, what, what's the internet? We network computers together and release the power of distributed computation. What culture does is it networks brains together and we release the power of distributed cognition and you had michael levin on here and eric hole and like there, there's evidence that those th those systems those distributed systems like right, solve problems and dan chappie and i have done work on this too we published on this that individual human beings can't solve and it's not just the aggregate sum of their individual cognition cognition is inherently dialogical rather than monological i would then add two more one is cognition is inherently emotional in the sense of affect and motivation. Uh, the way I talk about this from my own particular work is, uh, and, and, and this goes back to Heidegger, and I think Evan would agree with this, and Mark would definitely agree with this, the, the affect ladenness, the Mazio, Descartes' error, mm. right? That relevance realization is, it's not cold calculation. W the way we're fundamentally different from computers that don't do any kind of relevance realization is we care about this certain kinds of information and we don't care about others. And that is our fundamental power, by the way. And and that's that's an act of caring. It's an it's, it has an affect and motivational aspect to it. And then my sixth D would be exaptive, that what cognition does. It so uh, my tongue has been biologically exapted for speech. Tongues didn't evolve for speech. They evolved for poison detection, for mastication. Uh, but they're really good for repurposing for speech. And it looks like what the brain does is it repurposes our. Uh, Part, it, it repurposes machinery in quotes that it develops for navigating the sensory motor world and it exaps it up in to the cognitive world, which is why I'm doing all the things I'm doing. I'm doing this gesturing with my hands uh, because I'm moving through time and space in order to indicate how you should be moving through conceptual space. We talk about abstracting, which means to lift out. We subject, which is throw under. We project, which is throw against. Uh, you, you and I are just so sort of maybe midway through the course of this conversation and it hasn't been too hard we haven't pressed up against too many difficult and once you study this and i've studied conceptual metaphor the work of lakoff and johnson and published you know uh, criticisms of their theory not of the phenomena but of their theory um you realize how and then barbara tversky has mind in motion th this increasing that that um in fact this is a current theory about how general intelligence evolved it uh the the, the slogan is uh, uh, uh foraging into foresight mm. the, the frontal lobe in, enabled us to do this foraging navigation and then that got exapted into the cognitive processes we call foresight so that's the six e's and um so i i forgot how we got onto the six e's can you remind me what what our reason for going down the six e's was and what no, we're... I, you were just talking about four e cog and i remember and i just remember andy adding an extra e not too long ago so i just yeah, and that was my way uh, of saying that for ECOG psi, um, unlike uh, first and second generation COG psi, uh, for ECOG psi is third generation, ha places a huge emphasis on Husserlian, Heideggerian phenomenology. Dreyfus was, was a big bridging factor. Many other people um, are, 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 are significant uh, figures in uh, uh, bringing this uh, this phenomenological, um, I, I, I want, I, it's not existential, but the, 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 this more like Marlo Ponti, the, this very much embodied, you know, the phenomenology perception embodiment are crucial. Marlo Ponti plays a huge role in this. That, that was, a, I remember being a quite a fundamental, Ponti was one of them, Heidegger, just trying to embrace a sort of mental health approach that was, not necessarily lacking evidence-based medicine, but rather incorporating values-based practice. Because we often just practice medicine in a, say, in a way that we focus on the evidence, but 
we really take into account this phenomenological experience of the person and and trying to incorporate a values-based practice along with the evidence would be probably a, a better approach and i think then ties into this whole meeting crisis and people having this issue in this general yes. uh, crisis anything you want to add to that I, I think that's right uh i mean my my, my co-authors and i philip mizovic and christopher master pietro uh you know we argued that there's an overlap between the meaning crisis and the mental health crisis. Mm. And uh, I'm happy to say that is seems to be gaining traction in, in many uh, domains uh, because of the increasing understanding we're getting um, and, you know, experimentally based, good, you know, good theoretically modeling, modeling at work and all that of the deep connections between meaning and life and uh, mental health and also d d even physiological health. You know, Kelly, Kelly Allen's work on the psychology of belonging, if you don't have a sense of belonging, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. You're in trouble psychologically. You're in trouble physiologically. You're in trouble socially. Like, you're just in deep trouble. You're in fundamental dis-ease that may not be due to trauma or any kind of organismic, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, pathogen inside you. you. You're just, like, the, the meaning-making machinery is, like, fundamentally out of whack. Yes. And you're getting very, very diseased um, because of that. It's a, did we discuss the significance landscape? I can't remember if I asked you about that. Just, no, you haven't. I, I would, could you just d discuss how it, the significance landscape um, plays a role in understanding wisdom before we move on? Because I have another question that's going to follow up. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so that has to do with this idea um, that uh, relevance realization, when it's recursive, when you get relevance, when you get unconscious relevance realization machinery feeding uh, its results, I, 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 I hesitate to use this language, but let's, I'll just use it for now, into working memory, the global workspace and the attentional uh, area of working memory, uh, you get salience. Salience is basically relevance to working memory. It's how things stand out in your perception and grab your attention and orient you. And when you when you don't properly cultivate your salience landscaping, that's a term taken from the neuroscientist Ramachandran when he was talking about autism, um, with this idea about you're do, you and I are doing it right now. We're we're sizing up the situation. We're foregrounding and backgrounding, and even within the foregrounding, things have different sort of topologies of or, or topographies. I forget which one topographies of of salience, and it's always flowing. And so you're, you're constantly doing this salience landscaping. But if you don't tether that uh, to getting clear about, if you don't tether it to a concern for truth, you fall into what Frankfurt called bullshitting, hmm. uh, right? Which is the liar, the liar, the liar depends on your caring, notice the language, about the truth in order to manipulate your behavior. The bullshit artist gets you to stop caring about whether or not what is being said is true and just get caught up in how salient it is. And of course, almost all advertising works this way. We all know, and they know that we know, that what they're stating in the commercials is false. Like drinking this alcohol will not put you into a brightly lit environment in which there are sexually attractive people clearly enjoying your company. Go into a bar and you won't find any of those, uh, you know, at, at play. Uh, we know that, they know that, but what happens is all of that machinery is very well engineered, and this is why they pump hundreds of billions of dollars into it, to manipulate you to find the product salient. So when you walk into the liquor store, that brand of liquor jumps out at you. You know not why, and you go, yeah, I think I'll get that. And that's bullshit. And you can bullshit yourself tremendously. Um, and so you want to make sure that your salience landscape is first connecting up to affordances. This is what I call your presence landscape. Affordances, this is a notion from Gibson. It's a central notion to 4E Cogsci that our primary perception of the world is not of objects, but of affordances. So here's the, like the Cartesian way of talking about it is there's a, a water flask, you know, there's my water bottle over there. But what Gibson says is, no, no, what is first is the affordance of graspability mm -hmm. and then the affordance of carrying. And then within those affordances, um, I, get the no I, I get a more specific notion of water bottle. And the point about an affordance is the affordance, uh, you know, being it, uh, being it uh, you know, graspable is not in the bottle. 
It's you know not everything can grasp it. Can't be grasped by a paramecium, and it's not in my hand. I can't grasp Africa or the solar system. Um, it's a it's a it's a relation, a real relation of fittedness. So this is basically how you how are you presenting yourself to how the thing is presenting itself to you. So that's the presence landscape. The so you want to make sure you, is your salience landscaping finding real affordances for you obviously not in the commercial because you're not actually in, engaged with anything and then you want do those affordances and that enable you to causally interact with the world so you get you get into the depth of something you have ontological depth perception one of the things that distinguishes the real from the illusory is and this is an idea that goes back to michael polania although i think it's also in plato the real is inexhaustible. I can this this right. Compare this to the shadow of this. I examine the shadow a little bit, and I'm basically done. There's nothing much more, and that's why I think it's it's only a, it's only an appearance of the water bottle. The water bottle, though, I can keep exploring it and get more and more properties out of it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And for those of you who are listening, don't say, "Well, you can examine the light casting the shadow." Yes, you can, and that's not the shadow. Um, so uh, I'll put that aside. Um, and so you want your salience to uh, pick out affordances. Other people are talking about this too, Redfield and others, to pick out affordances that put you into the, the causal relations as opposed to merely correlational relationships with the world that allow you to unpack the world in its depth. So salience that tracks presence in depth is significance. And what we crave in meaning in life is we crave significance uh, we want to be deeply and truly, as an adverb, by the way, truly in rapport with reality. Um, and so wise people, um, one of the things that they're good at through both skill and improvisation, so they have this sort of mix of skilled improvisation, is of sort of zeroing in on significance. Mm. And so, with regards to the salience and, well, the significant landscape as a whole, let's take a someone who's wise going through some sort of an altered or higher state of consciousness. How do we reconcile the ineffability of these states of consciousness with their transformative impacts on these people? Um, so I laid a seed for that in how I previously answered you. So I'm glad you asked that question. So good. I used true as an adverb rather than as an adjective. Uh, and of course, this goes back to Heidegger and truth as uh, as an advent rather than as a static property possessed by propositions, for example. Um, and so what I want you to think about um, is when you have a moment of insight, how it's a moment when you go, oh, 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 I thought she was angry, but it turns out she's just afraid. And you totally reshape and you feel like you're now in contact with what is really going on. Mm -hmm. It's a moment of realization in both senses. This is the allothetic sense of truth that Heidegger talks about. And so what you want, right, is you want people sort of oriented uh, towards the idea that Getting at reality is very much an adverbial thing. Rather, rather than getting properties of their propositions, you want to pay attention to the procedures and processes that are going on. Okay, because to your point, in the higher state of consciousness, there is no conceptual propositional content whatsoever. Yeah. Like what? Like what? What? How could there be any truth here? So there isn't any truth in that sense, but. Things are happening truly. And what I what I want to say, well, what I've argued um, is what's happening in this higher state of consciousness is you're getting a ramped up version of the fluency effect. Mm -hmm. So fluency is, is a well-studied phenomena, well-evidenced phenomena that you will tend to judge the beauty or the truth of a of something in terms of how fluently you're processing it. So this has nothing to do with the content, and it's domain general. It has nothing to do with the domain you're in, okay? And so the brain is using not the content of ex experience, not the adjectival, but the adverbial in order to make fundamental assessments about how real is this. Mm. What I think is happening in 
the flow. So I think insight, Tobolinsky and Reber and others, I think insight is a spike in fluency. Mm. It's a sudden upsurge in fluency. That's why you get that aha. I've argued with uh, Leo Fer like they were my co-authors, Leo Ferraro, Harry, uh, uh, Arian Hera Bennett, um, that uh, flow is sort of an insight cascade where insights are priming each other. And you're doing that sort of thing you're doing in jazz and improvisation and rock climbing, right? And then what I've argued is going on in a mystical experience is you're flowing, but you're flowing in a very a very specific skill. You're not you're not getting into the flow state as you're playing hockey or as you're sparring. You're getting in the flow state in terms of your the way you stance towards reality, sort of your fundamental framing. So um, let me use that metaphor. So Marlo Ponti and others say, whenever I'm doing anything cognitive, as, as I would argue, I'm trying to fit myself to it. And and so I'm trying to do an optimal grip because my my cognitive fit is going to vary with the task I'm trying to solve. So like, how close should I be to this object to see it? Well, if I want to see the whole thing this far away, but if I want to, what, 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 what's written there? I got to go in closer. If I want to look at it as a projectile, I have to turn it this way. If I want to use it as a hand, like you see, there's all, and there's no one way of doing this because they're in trade-off relationships. Okay, so just stick me one more minute, okay? So when you're in a martial arts, you're fighting and and literally each each move you're making is some kind of optimal grip on your opponent. Is, is that okay? You're, you're trying to get what's just the right way of too close, too far, too tight, too loose in order to do what I need to do. Now, before you fight, you take a stance. Mm -hmm. You don't fight with that stance. That stance is like you don't use it. The point of that stance is to give you the 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 least amount of transform the least amount of transformative distance on average to any particular optimal grip you need to be get into. So from here, I can get quickly to here or here or here. That was a part of least resistance. It's yes, yes. And you're sort of equipoised, right? Mm -hmm. So that's your meta optimal gripping. Does that make sense? Meta optimal gripping. Now here's the point. You're doing that cognitively. You're, you're doing all this optimal gripping to pick up the bottle to do this, but you're always doing back and doing this fundamental orientation, your stance on the world. This is your meta-optimal cognitive grip. And what you're flowing with in a mystical experience is your meta-optimal gripping. Mm. And this is why people, one of the most prominent adjective along with and inter, interwoven with onto normativity is how beautiful how beautiful the experience is. Because of course, when people are experiencing fluency, they judge what what is causing the fluency to be more beautiful. And when you're getting sort of a fluency in, in a flow, in, you know, you're this, and think about how the flow state is already verging on the mystical, uh, one meant a loss of self-consciousness, right? Deep sense of participation, super salience, the, the, the depths of the world are disclosing itself. You just have to ramp that a little bit more, make it a little bit more domain general, right? And you've got, I would argue, what's going on in uh, a mystical experience. And then your brain is saying, wow, you're real, this, you've really got, you know, sort of a, 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 a flowing cognitive stance towards the world, and this is probably really plausibly, really, really adaptive. Do more of this. Do more of this. Do more of this. That's the argument. And then if Yaden and other people's work is right, that's not false. Just like we now. So when you're in the flow experience, you feel it's an optimal experience. And but you also generate your optimal performance. That's why athletes and martial artists try to get in the flow state. In a similar way, your sense that you're doing some kind of optimal stancing on the world is probably predictive of you actually orienting better towards the world. And this is what we find these people doing in these studies. They reorient towards other people themselves in reality, and their lives get measurably better by several objective measures of health and well-being and sociality, et cetera. So that, that's the argument. Sorry, that's a long argument. I tried to compress over an hour and a half. Yeah, fantastic of an job. It's very good. It's a, it paints a nice picture for people to understand. How are you and Greg approaching this book, upcoming book? Do, do you find that you're, you're, you're using this cognitive science, the Cox, four-year Cogsci revolution with psychological studies and philosophy, incorporating a multidisciplinary approach to your book of consciousness? Well, totally, totally. Um, and so uh, the book is based on some uh, 
some series on my channel, and the, uh, I think two of them also were on Greg's channel, uh, Untangling the World Knot, which was one we did on consciousness. And then uh, we did um, one on transcendent naturalism. Um, and then we also did one with Christopher Master Pietro, a dear friend of mine uh, and uh, co-author, um, on the elusive eye, the nature and function of the self. And we've taken this all together. And Greg was basically doing work in which he was trying to solve what he calls the enlightenment gap, break out of this Cartesian grammar, but he was trying to do it uh, big picture. And he was trying to lay out what is the descriptive metaphysics in which we can recover um, the kind of worldview that will allow us to talk about this, the subjective and the objective worlds in a coherent way mutually supporting fashion rather than this antagonistic uh, mutually undermining. And then my arguments about transjectivity and relevance realization and my argument for transcendent naturalism, um, which is, I mean, I can't, like, if you want, I can go into that, but there's a whole huge argument about that. Uh, well, anyways, but the point is, I sort of laid out a this is why Greg describes it. I sort of laid out a, 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 a structure of mm -hmm. the overarching argument. He worked out the content, yes. and then we're both using our interdisciplinary cog sci. Uh, him a little bit more emphasis in psychology, uh, psychology, therapeutic psychology. Mine a little bit more emphasis in psychology, cognitive so psychology, and philosophy and machine learning. And we're bringing it all together. That's what's happening in the book. Yeah. Um, is is there any sort of release time date? Anything we can expect is how. How far are you guys in the process? Um, so we're trying to time this because uh, the book that um, the the the, the book one of Awakening from the Meaning Crisis is coming out September 29th, um, and so uh, we're we're sort of trying to time things. The book on consciousness we plan to have written by the end of uh, this sort of this fall. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, who knows? I mean, you don't. The, the publication process can take anywhere from, you know, five months to five years. Um, so who knows? But I, I, my hope is that the book is released in 2025. Nice. Any any running titles for that book, John? I know publishers often get involved with that, but uh, you find that you guys have settled. I don't know. We 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 were we were still playing with, uh, you know, using the title from the series, "Untangling the World Knot," which is a, a, a nice title for it. Um, based on the Schopenhauer quote, uh, that the mind-body problem is the is the world not. Um, um, so uh, I don't know. I think we're sort of playing with that right now. Uh, what we're basically saying is um, our proposal with the idea of extended naturalism and transcendent naturalism is we can basically close the enlightenment gap. Mm -hmm. And then the division we make between adverbial... Uh, a quality and adjectival quality let us shrink the explanatory gap uh, uh of the hard problem and by collapsing the explanatory gap and shrinking the explanatory gap sorry by 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 collapsing the enlightenment gap and shrinking uh the explanatory gap we can make a lot of progress towards the hard problem of consciousness well uh, i'm looking forward to that uh, that's for sure T tell me john when the these higher states of consciousness, what implications do, do you think they have for existential anxiety and people's understanding of, of the meaning of life, trying to figure out this, what is they have, they have They have profound ones, but it requires us moving out of that Cartesian grammar in which we think all of knowing is propositional knowing. Um, we have to move out of that propositional tyranny. So let me, I, this is not exhaustive, it's just an exemplary answer. So one of the things that, you know, that is going on in people who are feeling their lives is meaningless. Well, there's the, there's the th big three A's. There's alienation. There's anxiety. We, we, you as a medical professional know that most people use the word anxiety very poorly and inappropriately. They use it when they mean fear or concern or apprehension. And I'm talking about medical level anxiety, right? Um, and then the, the third one, which I'm going to focus on, is absurdity. And of course, Camus made this very famous um, in, in many ways. Um, but for all of the brilliance, you know, I just taught a course on uh, in which one of the lectures was on Camus' The Plague. Uh, for all the brilliance in his portrayal of absurdity, Camus does not really give much of an explanation for it. Uh, 
Yes. The person who I think has given the seminal and I think still standing account of what's going on in uh, absurdity is Nagel. Uh, and what Nagel argues is that absurdity is a fundamental perspectival. He argues that all of the so-called arguments for absurdity are actually not logically valid. And if it was just a logical argument thing, you could just show that the argument is invalid and the people, the person's sense of absurdity would just go away. And of course, that's not what happens. And he argues that what absurdity is, again, I would say it's on a continuum. It's on a continuum with humor. Uh, humor is when there's a clash between perspectives and with improvisational play, we can resolve the clash, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, 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 and of course, metaphors on that continuum too. You've got Sam is a pig. Well, you've got this one perspective and this other perspective and they don't quite jive. And what you do is you hold the tension and, and et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not going to do a whole theory of metaphor here. <laughs> so, and he... Nagel gives a, 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 an example of sort of everyday absurdity. Now, his ex he wrote the original paper, The Absurd. He updated it in his book, The View from Nowhere. But when he wrote the paper, we still had to use these very, very, very primitive devices called answering machines, uh, in which people used to have an answering machine for their phone because the only phone they owned was the one that was at home. And when they weren't with that phone, they couldn't receive calls, so they would have an answering machine and you would leave a message. And the, and the little scenario goes like this. You know, Fred has just realized that he loves Susan. He really loves Susan. And so he calls Susan up and, and he hears the, the, the receiver picked up and he goes, Susan, don't say anything. I need to tell you, I love you. I love you. I love you. And then he hears, Susan is not here right now. Please leave your message. And you laugh. Notice the humor. But there's a touch of absurdity there because what's happening is Within his first-person perspective, what he's doing makes total sense and is very meaningful. But from the third-person perspective, it, it it makes no sense at all because, you know, it, it, it's not fitting into the general framework. And then what Nagel says is we, because of our capacity for self-transcendence, we can go to a cosmic perspective that makes our first-person perspective seem totally insignificant and that's absurdity when there's a fundamental clash between the first person and third person right now notice you by his own argument and this is part that i find maddening in nagel he by his own argument this is not propositionally driven and then he goes on to talk about this being a, a, a thing about doubt and more inferential skeptical arguments and it it's like no that's not the response if the machinery is non-propositional if it's a perspectival problem mm -hmm then the problem has to be dealt with by perspectival transformation. That's what these altered states of consciousness bring about. They bring about a radical shifting from egocentric perspective taking, often to a non-dual perspective, which is no perspective, but it's not the view from nowhere. It's simultaneously the most inward and the most outward and beyond, both, et cetera, et cetera. And this non-duality is properly analogous to the way a joke, a sense of humor, that little flash of insight rel relieves the perspectival clash and you get enjoyment and connectedness. The non-duality is a big version of that in which the perspectival clash is resolved and you get profound joy. How, if we had to take, if we had to back space, if we had to, let's say, backtrack a little bit from Nagel back to Camus, how would Sisyphus then apply this while pushing up this boulder. <laughs> so so this is something that most people don't know um, about Camus. So Camus is regularly identified as an existentialist or a nihilist. Um, uh, he rejected uh, he the term existentialism. Jean, Jean Sartre was the, was the actual... Existential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Sartre is a misunderstanding of what Heidegger meant by existential. Uh, and I won't get into why I think Sartre is one of the most overrated philosophers, why I think he's the Madonna of modern philosophy, if I can put it that way. No, uh, yeah, and sorry for I'd, Madonna I'd love fan. To know why, to be honest. <laughs> uh, because I, I, I think uh, Sartre fundamentally misunderstands what Heidegger is doing with his fundamental ontology um, mm. and how he is trying to get out of Cartesian onto epistemology and onto theology and 
Sartre reduces that to mere atheism and a mere kind of subjectivity kind of understanding. And that is to fundamentally misunderstand Heidegger's project. So what would Camus say about Sisyphus? Well, here's the thing that people don't know about what Camus actually was. Go back and read his thesis. It's on, it's on, it's on Christian, the title is Christian Metaphysics and Neoplatonism. He's a Christian Neoplatonist and his hero, the person he most would like to be and the person he thinks might have uh, done it was Augustine, although he's not sure about it. Because this is what he says. He says, if we're going to outgrow nihilism, we, we have to return to Christianity, but then we should continue to outgrow Christianity and return to Hellenism, go back all the way to, and what he, where he thinks we need to be is on the, on the horizon between Neoplatonism and Christianity with somebody like Augustine. And then I would say to him, you are right, but what you don't do, what you don't get, Albert Camus, and what Sisyphus needs to do is not just sort of toughen his identity and his will in an act of self-definition, he needs to practice Neoplatonic contemplation. And, you know, Camus studies Plotinus. He writes on Plotinus. He knows this. And, you know, and, all, and, and Augustine talks about contemplation. Theoria, all of this is there. That's the answer. That's what Sisyphus should do. Sisyphus should be pra pra practicing profound, prajnic, mindfulness as he's rolling the rock and I mean, that would be all like the time a, in the world to practice transcendence if you give to be fair yeah, exactly 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 and then this is like this is like he you know zen satori you know you get all these stories of the person's just sweeping the monastery you know uh you know uh courtyard and a, a pebble hits another pebble and there they they achieve satori enlightenment that's what uh sisyphus should be doing i would argue Mm. He should practice Zen Neoplatonism, because that would actually alleviate him. A part of your, a big chunk of your work focused on this a sort of transcendence. Buddhism was a big portion of that. Got you all along this path, and, and we know that Buddhism and other um, philosophies sort of emphasize transcendence and wisdom in relation to consciousness. How does this perspective influence you uh, personally, and then fall into your teaching in general? Um. So. I mean, I'm at a place, and this is, I actually advocate for uh, um, what I call Zen Neoplatonism, and, and that's not unique to me. I think Nishida is doing Zen, Zen Neoplatonism, the Kyoto School, Nishitani. Um, I think um, that there, you know, there's people who call themselves Zen Christians and Zen Catholics, and they're almost always plugging into the Neoplatonic mystical tradition and Christianity to do that. So this, in fact, this is something I'm going to be exploring in my next series, uh, the, the Philosophical Silk Road. Um, so both of those poles, and, and, and Zen, of course, is you get Buddhism and Taoism integrated together to get Zen. Uh, you, you throw in some Shinto too, but I'll put that aside. Um, and then, of course, Neoplatonism, you integrate uh, Platonism, Aristotelianism, and Stoicism, and some Pythagoreanism, a nice little spicing of it. Um, and so you get these great, huge synoptic integrations. Um, and they both, uh, they don't say the same thing, but they converge towards what you brought up, which is the centrality of, right, transcendence. Uh, but, um, but, it, it, they converge on the idea of non-duality as the way of understanding transcendence as opposed to what the word often connotes to people, which is there's two worlds, the world down here, and I go up somehow to another world, a super above, supernatural world, and that is what um, enlightenment or salvation uh, is. But what you get in Neoplatonism and Zen is you get... Um, you get no, no. It's so so classic Zen. When I when before I studied Zen, uh, mountains were mountains, rivers were rivers. While I was studying Zen, mountains weren't mountains and rivers weren't rivers. And when I was done studying Zen, mountains were mountains and rivers were rivers. You're recovering the depth, and this goes back to what we talked about. Your salience landscape has been educated to find the presence landscape that takes you into depth, right? Well, and so. That, that informs my work uh, terrifically. I, I want to ask this question. I want to ask um, what is going on cognitively in, tran in transcendence? And then is there an ontological um, partner in this? Mm -hmm. So in other words, uh, 
Is transcendence merely a psychological phenomena, or is it also an epistemological and ontological phenomena? Yes. Are you actually, like these traditions claim, are you actually going through a fundamental transformation of your entire person rather than just achieving a kind of psychological hygiene or insight? And I mean, these epistemological aspects of it all seem to align many, many transcendent experience. Often when you talk to people who have had them, there's, there's, there's similarities between a lot of them. And there, there seems to yeah. be sort of a conformity there. Um, do you find any sort of ontological grounding? Do you think that, for example, let's say someone who comes in with a, a quantum, quantum theory of consciousness and, then, and, and tells you, okay, that's, that's the level of transcendence. That's where this belongs. Is you're entering this field and finally and becoming one of the universe. Do you think those people are getting it completely wrong? or? <laughs> Well, I, I think they are in that um, they are understanding reality as the church of whatever level they think they we should stop our analysis at. Yeah. And they have, have, of course, and Ned Block made this famous argument a long time ago that needs to be more famous is like, um, once you start saying the real is this level below, you're committed to going to the very, 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 very bottomest reel that's even level, I should say, that's possibly conceivable to you. And then you end up in this weird, purely mathematical, platonic realm of probability distributions that are existing in superposition, which is basically the modern version of eternity. Um, and then, you know, and then there, somehow it collapses and you get emergence upward. But that emergence is not an epiphenomena because we're doing real measurement somehow. This is the measurement problem. And right, so there's somehow top down effects and it goes on and on up. And as you go up, oh no, it gets also enmeshed with relativistic uh, properties. And we got at the bottom, we've got this sort of pure entanglement and they're now making, it's gaining you know, momentum that space time emerge out of entanglement, uh, but constrained by relativity. So it's pure relationality, bottom up emergence, top down emanation. And then what I say to them is, congratulations, you just rediscovered late Neoplatonic philosophy. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's. I find uh, I find it for a lot of people quite frustrating when they realize that these the people who have the epistemological views on these seem to have think that the ontological there's some sort of ontological truth to it. Do you find those people who fight that battle to say they're ontologically gnostic about this? They know that this is the ontological reality, this other realm, almost hinder this um, process you guys are trying to go through by trying to teach people to go down this route. I think as long as you're, uh, I think, and I, I, I you know, I, I think this is a mainstay, even from first generation Cogsci with multiple realizability, but developed more with dynamical systems in, um, uh, you know, in, in understanding within neural networks in second generation, and then taken beyond that into uh, four E Cogsci third generation. Uh, the idea that any reductive account of cognition um, uh, and of reality. So if what I said were, it was right earlier, like if the, it's more properly how the mind and world fit together, sorry, sorry, how how embodied brain and, and world fit together, that is your mind. Your mind is a fittedness uh, relation and process rather than a substance inside your skull. If that's right, then if you agree that the that you can't give a reductive account of mind, you're also committed by parity and symmetry to saying, well, you can't give a reductive account of reality, but I just gave you an argument. I give you many other arguments and, you know, and I, this will be in the book of why we are now moving back to a, not only a space time continuum horizontal, but an ontological continuum, right. Um, uh, uh, that has a vertical, these are metaphors, dimension to it. So it's not only unfolded in space time, it's un, it's unfolded, between all these different levels that we can analyze. I think the reality is a continuum and the levels are are due to where we cut into the continuum for our particular set of problems we're trying to solve. Mm. But so I don't I don't think of it as a, a, as a, a top world and a bottom world. I think of it as a polarity in which there's a complete interpenetration of bottom up emergence and top down emanation. Mm. Uh, bottom-up causation and top-down constraint to use some of your language 
Yes. <laughs> Along those lines, what do you think are some of the most common misconceptions or myths about consciousness? Or which isms, for example, do you find most incorrect? The illusionism, uh, uh, idealism, what are your thoughts on the other isms that are not sort of the weak panpsychist view that you <laughs> kind of wear? Okay, so the one that I think almost everybody agrees is um, just not on the table is the one that... Uh, <sighs> Is the one that is sort of the most prevalent in the in the non-academic, non-scientific world. And so there's a sense in which the news isn't getting out, other than in this sort of nihilistic, nasty way. Um, so the the view that almost everybody rejects is dualism. Yes, yes. But the and mind is an Apparently, I think yeah. a study was done that shows that that's the most common view that most lay people have. Is there some that's sort right. of yeah, dualism? Dual and 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 it is it is the almost almost universally not completely but almost universally rejected view within the scientific yes. philosophic academic study and you can understand why it's a major view of uh, 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 uh of sort of uh, and i don't mean this pejorative term this is just a label okay. lay people right uh, because yeah, sure. it's, it seems common sense obvious to us that we have an, our inner experience and then we have our outer body. Uh, we talk about having a body and having a mind. We talk as if they're substances. Uh, we talk about it as its thing. And then we get religions often promising us that our mind or our soul or our essence or our person or whatever, um, and I'm not anti-religious, but th this part I don't get, um, that that can somehow survive our brain's death. Mm personal immortality and that that requires dualism and when and in you know sometimes i think in some of the courses i should teach should come with a major trigger warning or a health warning or something because um the arguments against dualism i think and, and clearly not just me yeah. overwhelming you know consensus across multiple generations and multiple disciplines is dualism is bankrupt and that means if the promise of personal immortality depends on dualism and dualism is bankrupt, so is the promise of personal immortality. Mm. The Christians may be able to get out of this or the Muslims because they were the resurrection of the body, but that's just a miracle. And so I don't know what to do with that. That's not a scientific proposal. You, you um, know, think of it now that when I think about it now, I realize that because this show has mostly professors, philosophers, scientists, I don't think I've ever interviewed a dualist now that I think about it. Well, and to no surprise, because um, you face the problem for which your show is named, that dualism over multiple centuries has made absolutely no progress on solving, which is the mind-body problem, right? Uh, but, and of course, the, that, even the mind-body problem, the term in itself almost indicates some sort of a duality. It is, it is, it is, it, right? And, and, and it was basically given to us by Irony. Descartes. Yeah. Yes. Descartes and the scientific revolution. Um, so dualism, I think, is off the table. Illusionism, I don't know what illusionism means, um, uh, you know, um, because, uh, and it's, it, it, okay, to, to my point, real and illusion are comparative terms. You can't say everything is an illusion. It's like saying everything is tall. It makes no sense. It sounds like you're saying something. So what happens in illusionism, and I, this it's always what happens when I talk to major illusionists is, well, most of experience, but this type of experience, the mathematics, my a prior mathematics, that's real. That connects me to real. And then you and then you need the argument, well, why does that have a privileged access? And usually there's none forthcoming. It's just an intuition. Um, and so I generally, I find illusionism unconvincing for, for that reason. Um, um, now, idealism. Idealism is harder because it comes in many varieties. Um, I mean, in some sense, both Berkeley and Hegel are considered idealists, and they're talking about radically different things. Yeah, Berkeley's, as as, one, Berkeley's one incorporates God a lot more than. Yeah, well, and also it's about you know it's it's about that the world is is in some sense a dream, and, mm. and there's no such thing as matter. Um, and I think when idealism is that kind of idealism that uh, that 
the external world and the material world are illusions. It's not illusionism because they say quite clearly mind is real and consciousness is real and it's all consciousness. Uh, then I have problems with that. And these are the traditional problems with idealism, uh, which is, you know, uh, why do, are there, how do you get multiple minds? Well, well they're, they're separate from each other. You just invoked a spatial term. You just invoked us. You're 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 cribbing in space and time to get something that pure mind doesn't get. Well, they're they're they think different thoughts. W what makes the thoughts different? Mm -hmm. They're about different. Oh, about so they're set. You just keep smuggling in the thing that you need to explain, mm -hmm. and then of course the deep past, uh, things going on outside of sentient awareness, like what like presumably things were going on at the mac microscopic level, the atomic level since the beginning, and no sentient being until very recently was in any way aware of them, uh, had any cognition, and yet, so there must, and then you have to bring in God, right? And then you have, okay, you can't have a premise that's more controversial than your conclusions. First, convince me there's a God, and and good luck. <laughs> and then, right? Uh, I, so, idealism is out. I take panpsychism, especially the Whiteheadian version, much more seriously. Mm. Um, the idea that, that because it's close to uh, a central idea of forty cogsci, which is deep continuity. That mm. the deep continuity says the principles of cognition. There are shared principles between cognitive principles and biological principles. And there are shared principles between autopoetic biological principles and self-organizing principles. And then there's shared principles between uh, uh, self-organizing systems and broadly uh, dynamical systems uh, that are usually uh, overlap with dynamical system. I won't get into that, but you get a, you get a deep continuity and, and people have said, and Michael says this, and I take Michael very seriously. He says, you know, Cognition goes way below the neuronal level. He makes that argument explicitly and learning and problem solving. And, and it's not clear where it bottoms out for him. Um, I think it bottoms out for him and uh, when there, when the cognitive light cone becomes zero. Yeah. So he has the idea that when you measure cognition by how deeply the organism can anticipate the world. I think that's fundamentally right. I think the two, the two interlocking meta problems for any cog cognitive agent and, the, and solving these is what makes you generally intelligent because these are meta problems for any problem you're trying to solve is anticipating the world and zeroing in on the relevant information. And as you anticipate more, you have to do more relevance realization, et cetera. But if intelligence is a, a measurement of your anticipatory light cone, then I think he, he acknowledges this. As you go down, right, this this vertical level, like drop below the brain to the neuron, like the light cone is getting shallower and shallower and shallower. And I think he thinks it, it collapses far above the level of quantum entanglement or something. Yeah. I'm not sure where it does, but, and I, Michael, if you're listening and I got it wrong, I apologize. That's my best take on what I've heard you argue. Yeah. And I, I'm sort of close to him on this. Um, I think something there's a kind of continuity with in i think i think a paramecium is doing a very primitive kind of relevance realization mm. and so i and i think michael's right there's there's maybe stuff happening between the organelles within a microbe that look like intelligent communication yes. and and and, uh, and and so i'm willing to go quite a ways down yeah. now the thing you can't do um you can't, can't do, like you can't, and, and, and Michael doesn't do this, and this is why I don't know if he's a standard panpsychist. I don't think he would call himself a panpsychist. I, 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 I think I don't think he does call himself a panpsychist. Right. Uh, so that's why he and I are more like the deep continuity hypothesis yeah. because we take the aggregation problem seriously. Uh, so the standard problem facing this panpsychist tries to explain how we have mind by saying, well, the the things that we're made out of have mind, and the problem with that is, well, what kind of mind, like. You know, you know, it's that deep problem that starts to occur. Yeah, that that well, it's like, the, the, and then what you get is well, what I'm interested in is I'm interested in the kind of consciousness and intelligence you have that can solve the kind of problems you have, and then what is invoked is well, there's complexity. It's more complex, and then it's like, then you're invoking a kind of emergence that's going along with the complexity, and that's what I need an account of. And Michael and I are, and Greg and I are trying to do that. 
Whereas standard panpsychism doesn't do that. Now, I think that Matt Segal and some of the, the cutting edge Whiteheadians, they're trying to, and I don't mean this in a in a in an inappropriate sense, they're sort of rereading Whitehead and trying to, on his behalf, try and get a solution to the aggregation problem. That's why they also don't use the word panpsychism. They use pan experientialism. And and I think that the gap between pan experientialism and kind of the deep continuity is it's it's very, it's very small. Um, and so those are the positions um, I think, sorry, that's my stance on these positions and how it converges with other people. And a, a lot of people in 4E COGSI are sort of moving to, towards that kind of overall orientation. I think that it, it's, I found that to also, I've, Daniel Dennett, rest in peace to him, I noticed that towards the later stages of his life, uh, from illusionism, Prior, I noticed because he started doing a lot of work with Michael Levin, and then he started talking about cognition all the way down. I, I felt like he was slowly getting towards that, to what you're talking about. Which yeah, he is. And for, because, you know, uh, first of all, Dan Dennett knows the relevance realization problem. Yeah. He wrote one of the classic presentations of it, you know, in, you know, uh, um, in, in, oh, in The Robot's Dilemma. Uh, the chapter in the Bro yes. robot's dilemma. He know, he's deeply aware of that, and I, and, I, and Dan Dennett is. Um, Dan Dennett was the only one of the four horsemen that I take seriously as a uh, as the gener uh, as a theorist. What yeah. and what I mean by that is somebody who's able to engage in uh, you know significant, widely developed argument across many different kind of interlocutors. Dan Dennett was good at that. I, and I think he was aware of, you know, the arguments coming out of Eric Hall, uh, uh, other arguments uh, like from your Alicia Guerrero and others, in which this bottom up, top down ontology um, is becomes more and more plausible. And thank God, because there has been just an overwhelming convergence that your cognition is top down, bottom up in a completely parallel recursive fashion. And so thank God that the grammar of your cognition and the grammar of reality are like fundamentally the same because that is reason for believing that you're not trapped in absolute skepticism or solipsism or anything else like that it's it's crazy because when i when i was reading one of mike's papers prior to his interview when he the acknowledgments at the bottom it had dan dennett it had you john viveki bernardo castro mark solms carl frist and anil Seth. it had so many different pioneers in the field who all almost have very different views on consciousness yeah. which goes yeah. to show how well this field is growing as a as a unit altogether that these different thinkers are coming together with such different theories but they're all building on top of each other at this point we, we are and i was just fortunate to be with uh co-author with uh johannes jaeger um, uh, Alex Jabedovic, who's a student of mine, and Riddell, who's a student of mine, and uh, uh, Dennis Walsh, who's a colleague of mine at the University of Toronto, on the new paper we just published on naturalizing relevance realization. It's the same sort of thing. I think the I think we what we're seeing is these these frameworks. You've got the predictive processing framework, which is really addressing the anticipation problem, but it needs the relevance realization framework, which really needs the auto poetic framework, which really overlaps with the the thing the the framework that Mike's building, and I I am arguing that these these huge integrative frameworks are basically doing what Zen and Neoplatonism did. They are converging towards each other with an increasing momentum. And now you've got look uh, Evans' book, The Blind Spot. It's not just his book. He's actually third author on it, but I, he's my friend. So, um, But he, he wrote it with an astrophysicist and a theoretical physicist about everything we're talking about. It's so convergent with this. like, And so there's many physicists and philosophers of science. Um, you know, the idea that it's pure relationality lines up with structural realism, lines up with a lot of the... Like, I am... I, I'm hopeful... I'll be I'll I'll be bolder. I think it is reasonable to be hopeful that we are getting a convergence between our psychology, our epistemology, and our ontology that will put us in a place whereby we can more deeply legitimate, cultivate, and create the practices and the ways of life that will alleviate the meaning crisis. Mm. That's that's so beautifully put, uh, John. The I when I did the intro to this, I mean, one of the tra part of the trailer for this podcast was to was to highlight how this multidisciplinary approach has to be taken. 
Um, yes. Um, do you, you, in not not reductionism in the redu in the reducing aspect, but rather to incorporate every layer, bring them all back together, and sort of bring them um, almost fuse them into one kind of um, aspect. And the, and the the quest to conquer to conquer consciousness, I said, will require a cumulative culmination of collaborative encounters. <laughs> oh, nice alliteration there. That's very, know, that rolls on, rolls that very nicely. My dissertation, to be fair, I use that just as a nice way to. <laughs> Well, but still, that's good. That's good. I love those alliterations. They always, they always sound very, they make you sound much Me better. Too. <laughs> Me too. Me uh, too. You noticed in my work, they show up a lot. Yes, uh, they do. The, the, do you, what do you see as the upcoming, the, the forefronts of this um, cog sci psychology uh, philosophy revolution that's, that we're about to encounter? Because, I mean, the work that's being put out at this point, so many different people, so many different parts of the world. Mark Soms, for example, Mike and I were talking about it the other day. He's, got, he's now talking about what's known as the fault uncertainty principle, which I think you should check out at some point, fault uncertainty okay. theory. But he, he's, got, he's being funded by the Oppenheimer Foundation. I, I think you're familiar with this. I'm not sure. To work on AI. And Mike right. thinks that Mark is going to be the one to figure out some sort of artificial intelligence that does um, mimic a human sort of general intelligence. He believes that Mark would well, be. I, I, I hope Mark reads my paper then, because uh, we we met, I think we made a really powerful argument that uh, relevance realization. Uh, I've got a whole bunch that relevance realization is at the core. Anticipatory relevance realization is at the core of general intelligence, and that I, I'm, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna send that to him. <laughs> yeah, please do. Oh, uh, definitely because, will. Because I, one of the core theses of that paper um, is that. Uh, you, you uh, that relevance realization is fundamentally not computational in any strong sense of the word computational if you just mean compu if you just say well what i mean by computation is any is any functional relation between things that can be uh, causally realized which is like the universe then of course um and then you say things like yeah and the, the universe is a computational machine it's like it sounds like you're saying something important but you're just saying the universe is made up of functional relations that are that are taking place through causal interaction. It's like, yeah, we knew that. We've <laughs> known that since the Greeks. Um, so that, so if you mean computation in any strong sense that has any strong implications for your cognitive theory, then relevance realization is not computational in nature. Um, and that, so, I, so what's his name? What's Mark's last name? Mark Solms. S O L M S. I've I, I, I've I've come across the name, and his theory is called the felt uncertainty principle. Theory, yeah, felt uncertainty theory. Mark's work work. His book is called The Hidden Spring. Just for those listening, he's he's from Cape Town, so he's not too far from where I am. So, which is good. It's, it's always good to promote another a fellow South African. I feel like there's not too many of us doing this. It's incredible. Well, same with Canadians. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so so um, any any time any chance I get to just uh, put his name out there, I always try to to do it. But Mark's theory is very good. Apparently, Mark once attended a conference where Thomas Nagel was talking, and Mark was taken aback by this, because Nagel said, there's a South African guy, uh, his name is, um, I, I think it's Mark, but I think he's onto something with consciousness. And and Mark took that as the highest praise that he could he could ever receive. Well, I have to take a look at this then. Yeah, um, yeah. so um, Mike was, we were talking about Mark's work, and uh, yeah, he seems to be gaining a lot of traction with his theory, but yeah, he puts affect uh, as the core, but his work is very different in, in in various ways, and I don't want to butcher it. Where do you see it, this con consciousness revolution going in the next, let's say, decade? Where do you see the research going? I think, uh, and it may be, uh, you know, especially the way I put affect um, in, in the core of relevance realization around caring, and that you're dealing with situations that are high in novelty, ill-definedness, and emergent uncertainty. Sounds like there's a potential convergence between my work and Mark's work. So no, I think take a look. there's so much more than you think, because the more you talk about it, the more I think about him, which is the only reason why he's coming to my mind every time. Um, but he puts affect at the very core of this, and he and he calls it what's known as the cortical fallacy. He thinks we've been obsessed with this for so long that um, that many people yeah, don't realize that the essence of consciousness is more within feeling, and and you feel your way through reality rather than just rational. Yeah, yeah, and the pro and uh, and and I'm not attributing this to him by any means. The problem we have is we got part of the enlightenment gap is we peeled off between sort of positivism and romanticism and romanticism told us how we're supposed to talk about our feelings and what feelings are and what their ontological status is and their epistemic status. And that is locked into the grammar of this problem that we're in. 
You have to break, you have to get, you have to let go of romanticism. People who think that the solution is to give up on sort of scientism and then adopt romanticism are falling into this, they're just falling into the other side of the same problematic framework. So I, I agree with that, uh, that we we need to get rid of that and we have to recover a non-romantic notion of affect and feeling. And it sounds like he's doing that. So I want to take a listen. To, your, to answer your question, I think what's happening is what I, I said. I think what's happening is there's going to be a growing convergence between the predictive processing framework, uh, relevance realization for e uh, the kind of deep continuity biology that Mike is doing, and um, people from, uh, from sort of physics um, uh more broadly, that are also uh, and neuroscience uh, integrating with. I, I think all of these frameworks we're going to get uh, we're going to get something analogous to what happened in biology when Mendelian genetics were integrated with Darwinian natural selection, uh, and that didn't mean the theory was done. Dar that that the, the modern synthesis is going through huge the 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 exciting science right now theoretically philosophically is biology. It's going through huge revolution. Um, but to 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 your to to your question, I think that's where we're headed. I think we are headed for a grand convergence uh, in which we get the framework, um, mm -hmm. and it'll be and it it will be radically unlike the framework we have, and it will have huge implications reverberating backwards into our theology, into our ethics, into our aesthetics, into our politics. Um, I, was, I, that, I was just about to ask you about um, the yeah. ethical framework and moral frameworks around this. Where do you think and how do you think people who are curious about your work and curious about just higher states of con consciousness and varied states of consciousness, what are the ethical or moral ramifications of, of trying to achieve these states? I think there is an ethical obligation on the people given my earlier arguments, who are trying to realize these states, to realize them as having to be homed within a living ecology of practices. There is no panacea practice. That's what a lot of this COGSI shows. There is no one practice. You, all, they, ha they have complementary strengths and weaknesses, bias and variance, no free lunch theorem, uh, things like this, sort of very formal arguments. And so you need what ecologies are. You need all these trade-off relationships and opponent processing um, uh, and, and checks and balances. So you, And that's what religions used to do. You need, you need a sapiential framework and ecology of practices within which you are cultivating these uh, altered states of consciousness so that they are regulated by and in service to the cultivation of wisdom and virtue. I think that's the important thing. Now, the positive side of this is, what I said earlier, is that these states help to alleviate moral issues, not about harm reduction, but about growth affordance. Like we need to, you know, where we're not talking about healing people from harm or suffering, we're talking about liberating people uh, to, towards more flourishing. And I think that one of the moral implications that's going to come back is we're going to, we're going to, and our culture is mired because we have reduced to a harm reduction. That's all morality is. Morality is a legislated rule-based harm reduction. It's kind of a weird Frankensteinian Kantianism, right? Uh, uh, this rule-based harm reduction, and that's all it is. It's, it's kind of like if Bentham and Kant had a mongrel child that was left and <laughs> abandoned or something, you know? You know? Um, and, and, and so um, I think what's going to happen is we're going to realize, no, 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 as the, as the vertical dimension of ontology comes up, we are not going to be concerned. We should not stop being concerned but we're not going to be just concerned with horizontal harm. We're going to be properly concerned with vertical growth where that is not part of a narcissistic project of self-improvement and gaining more status and having the wonderful experiences you know that mean I'm a special and unique person and I'm so unique and I'm so special and you, but don't you know that I'm unique and I'm very special. And the important thing is I'm unique and I'm special and you know it's like, oh my gosh. Um, so hopefully... Um, not only will the people pursuing this realize the moral obligation, the ethical obligation to home the pursuit of transcendent states within a sapiential framework, but they will also tutor 
the society at large about we need a morality that is not only about avoiding harm, but also affording transcendence. Yes. I was talking to Roy Baumaster about something similar to this, where we're discussing positive psychology and the approach of how people take. And there's certain studies that show that if you, if you give someone too many compliments prior to doing something, um, they tend to do a little bit worse than if someone gives a sort of a constructive critique that guides them towards yep. it. And I think yeah. that's it's 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 different, but it's similar in that regard. Is that it is it is, it overlaps, and you know, and and and, and Baumeister does a lot of work on meaning in life, and and that's where his work and my work, uh, you know, his work and my work intersect in, in many in, in many ways. I teach I teach some of his work in some of my courses. Hmm. Uh, along that line, I was going to say because this episode, I mean, it's our first time chatting on the podcast, and hopefully there'll be many more. But I wanted to focus on consciousness and the mind body problem. If, if you were giving a lecture right now, and if you had to give the students recommended reading, which philosophers and which psychologists or neuroscientists would you put in your in your hierarchy at like the most fundamental reads for these people trying to understand this quest to under, for con consciousness? You need to lead, you need to read Alicia Uraro's work, uh, Dynamics in Action, and Context Changes Everything. You need to read Evan Thompson, at least his new book, The Blind Spot. You need to read a lot of Gallagher's work, uh, probably doing the best work on 4 e -Sci out there. I then think it's really important uh, to take a look at the work of James Filler, uh, his book on, uh, I, I always get the title the wrong, I think it's Heidegger Neoplatonism uh, and the History of Being, uh, Relation as Ontological Ground, because he basically makes a powerful argument for bringing back uh, the Neoplatonic framework, and I've been arguing that the Neoplatonic framework and the four e they deeply integrate with each other. I'm going to be giving a guest lecture online July the 5th on the connections between Neoplatonism and four e Um So I think James's book, I think J everybody I recommend James's book to, uh, I haven't I haven't met him in person. We've email corresponded. I hope to meet him in person soon. Uh, they say it's one of the most important books they've read. Um, and so that book, um, Urero's work, uh, Evan Thompson's work, uh, Gallagher's work, and if I may, I think taking a look at some of the work by John Verveke and Greg Enriquez is uh, is, is 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 important too. Um, I think my, my my most recent paper on the, the is, sorry my paper my from 2012 on the papers I've done on relevance realization. Just take a look at those. Start start from 2012 onward. I mean, I mean, it, there's a lot of incredible work there. You're absolutely right. The where I'll put links to most of it in, anyway. The do, in terms of historical figures, philosophers, who, who do you think would would allow someone to ground their understanding of this problem the best? Um, I think you got to come to a profound appreciation of the non-Cartesian take, and the best way of doing that is cross historical and cross cultural. I would argue that you take a look at some very uh, what's called third way um, Platonic scholarship. People like Gonzalez, Drew Highland, Drew Highland, Finitude and Transcendence on Plato, uh, Plato and the Question of Beauty. Um, get 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 a good grasp, and then Hado, uh, uh, what is ancient philosophy? Um, and then read some of the you know um, read a bit more on, on the the Neoplatonic tradition on. Plotinus on Proclus on Dionysus. I'm going to be doing that in the philosophical Silk Road. But then also take a look at how non-duality was. I don't know what to call it. Realized um, outside of the Western uh, framework. And Neoplatonism, by the way, is the spiritual. Uh, Arthur Verslewis is right. Neoplatonism is, is the spiritual grammar of the West. The, the mystical tradition in Christianity, Neoplatonic. Sufism in Islam, Neoplatonic. Kabbalah. And Ju Judaism, Neoplatonic, Neoplatonism, Neoplatonism. It drives, right? And it drives, but it also drives the scientific revolutions in the Renaissance and in uh, the Einsteinian revolution. So, like, you got to get that. And then, right, that gets you outside of, uh, you know, an unquestioned Cartesian framework. And then, cross culturally, take a look uh, at the Kyoto School, the work of Nishida, Nishitani, get what non dualism looks like. And then there's some good books on non-dualism. Loy's book is good on that. And get what that looks like. David Bracken's book, just taught on it, The Divine Matrix, excellent introductory books because he basically runs across, it's kind of like the travelogue for the philosophical Silk Road. Um, and then that will give you ways of breaking outside of this. And then 
you can you could you you will I I predict um, the diligent reader will start to find these connections that I've been uh, making for themselves. You know, I asked this question pretending like it's for the audience, but the truth is I'll watch this back and, and add all of these to my comments. <laughs> yeah, more selfish quest on that part. The, John, in your, in your way of transcending reality or consciousness, what do you find most works for you? So I would say I never transcend reality. I yeah. say I would say I I, trans, I transcend into reality. Mm -hmm. uh, to use uh, Ursula Goodenough's excellent term, mm -hmm. um, and this is the distinction that Nishida makes between transcendent transcendence and imminent transcendence. Mm -hmm. um, so that goes towards the realization of significance rather than the idea of getting to the supernatural. Uh, so just to, to be clear, I I practice a a, 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 a long-standing ecology of practices. Uh, I I do. Um, I do Tai Chi Chuan, uh, Fajin, um, uh, I do I Chuan, Jan Zheng, Qi Kung. Um, um, uh, I also do some Jeet Kune Do. Um, and uh, then I do um, some Buddhist meditative practices. Um, and then I do um, uh, Neoplatonic practices. Um, and, and this has to do with what's called theurgia. And if you want to know what that is, look at the excellent work of Gregory Shaw about Neoplatonism and Theurgia, not sort of the modern misappropriation of that by weird woo people. I'm talking about the actual historical phenomena. Um, and so I do a whole host of practices, and, and uh, there's seated practices, movement practices, practices that are inherently dialogical in nature, practices that, that I and that I do with other people. Um, there are imaginal practices. We talk about dying um as for the cultivation of wisdom you want to do dialogical practices that's the d imaginal practices that's the i mindfulness practices that's the m and then embodied practices which is all this Im uh, embodied in action embeddedness practices and, and you want them to have all these checks and balances so you want to you want to counterbalance a meditative practice where you're moving in with a contemplative practice that's moving out. You want to counterbalance a stillness practice with a moving practice. Mm -hmm. You want to counterbalance a practice that goes into the depths of your experience with a practice that goes into the depths of your intelligibility, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so we talk a lot about this, um, you know, in the Verveki Foundation on the Awaken to Meaning platform about um, sort of... Um, how we've gleaned from the tradition and sort of reverse engineered practices. So you have this rich ecology of practices uh, that does all of this checks and balancing, mutual um, self-correction, but also complexification, also complexification that mm -hmm. affords emergence um, and development. At what at point in your life did did all of this sort of come together? Do you was it a gradual process, or at some point when you when you were a kid, did you just suddenly realize, okay? Everything I'm reading is just not right, and you need to explore something deeper. That's a long story. Um, <laughs> I mean, I was brought up. I was brought up in a family, not just nuclear, but extended family of a very, what I came to call later, a very traumatizing form of fundamentalist Christianity, mm. and I rejected that, and I went very much into a scientific nihilistic frame. Um, but that taste for transcendence that religion leaves in your mouth didn't leave me. Um, and then I, when I got to university, um, I read the Republican, an intro to philosophy course I was taking. I met the figure of Socrates, and I read the, 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 the account of transcendence in the Republican. and I went, that's what I want right there. Where transcendence and reason are bound together, where beauty and truth are interwoven together. And I started cultivating that. But the problem is academic philosophy at that time, it's changing now. But at that time, even though it's in the title of the word, didn't study wisdom. I didn't. I didn't take a single course after that course in which the word wisdom was mentioned. <laughs> and so I, I like I. I was hungry to cultivate the kind of wisdom that I saw portrayed by Plato in in the figure of Socrates. And so down the street, literally down the street from where I was living at the time, there was a dojo teaching meditation and Tai Chi, the Tai Chi and Meditation Center. And unbeknownst to me, I was introduced to an ecology of practices. I was introduced to Tai Chi Chuan that was counterbalanced by Vipassana meditation that was counterbalanced by metta contemplation. 
And that started unfolding for me. And what started to happen is this was unfolding and I started to get very interested in cognitive science. And then I started to get interested in how cognitive science was talking about these things, especially second and even more so third generation for e-cognitive science. And it all started to come together for me. And I started to, I was teaching a course, Evan Thompson was supposed to teach it and he couldn't teach it. So he recommended me. Thank you, Evan, uh, on, on Buddhism and cognitive science. And I was, I was, I was proposing the thesis that why Buddhism was going through a resurgence and integrating with cognitive science is that that integration was a response to the meaning crisis. And as I made this argument, my students' eyes were lighting up. Same time I was doing this, I had I was given a course on higher cognitive processes, and I thought there's now an emerging and well developed psychology of wisdom. I'm going to teach a course on the psychology of wisdom and the cognitive science and neuroscience of wisdom, and my students' eyes lit up, and then I realized, oh, and I started bringing all of this together, and then in psychology. I was teaching a course on thinking and reasoning, and I did a lot of work on insight. And when I talk about insight and flow, my students and I realized, and then I drew all of these together. And a former student of mine, he he came to me and he said, you know, my dad's a, a professional editor, and I I am a professional videographer, and I have a crew, and we will film for free you putting this course on YouTube. And so I took the Buddhism and Cogsci course. I took the course on the psychology of wisdom and the psychology of insight, and I made Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. And I that's mean, how that, I got that, there. And that lecture series is absolutely amazing. The And, and you can see it's doing so well. The People watch that all the time. Um, I think one of your most viewed videos on your channel is the first episode of the, <laughs> of yeah. the Meaning Crisis, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, which means people are watching this in order because you go down and you see the second most viewed is episode two. <laughs> So yeah. they're legitimately starting at the top. Yeah, and I, I get a lot of people writing in to say, you know, here I'm. This is my fifth time through the series, um, and I appreciate that. I mean, the the awakening from the meaning crisis is very extensive, like this. It goes it goes towards the synoptic integration that you and I are talking about, mm -hmm. and then I follow that up with after Socrates, which is a much more intensive, which is okay. Suppose you want to take up the Neoplatonic, the Socratic Neoplatonic way. What would that look like? How would you understand that? How would you legitimate it? What would that, so not only a lecture series, but what were the what would be the practices? And so that's there to, doing that. Um, so yeah, that's that's what's, how that's how that's what got you into this. I mean, that was your journey getting into it. What's what's driving you right now? What's making you do this? What is the driving force behind this? I, I I I want to do my most responsible, very very best to afford the amelioration of the meaning crisis and the way it's getting worse and destroying individual lives, collective communities. I mean, there is a significant aspect of the meaning crisis to the way the United States is ripping it, itself apart in a, let's put it really clearly, a religious civil war. Um, and, um, and, um, I, and, you know, and what's happening, like, I was talking to somebody and my work is is apparently getting sort of really taken up and becoming more influential in Japan, which is great because I'm going to be traveling there because people think of, you know, but but some people might have heard of, you know, the phenomena of the people who don't want to go outside and they just want to stay in the virtual world. That's a symptom of the meaning crisis. Many people don't know that Japan has, I think, the highest work-related suicide rate in the world. Like, so things like this. And so I want to do everything I can. So I do the science. I create these video series. I try to create a call uh, with, with you know, oh, sorry, I participate with many other people in trying to create the science. I was talking from my responsibility, but I don't want to take credit individually uh, in, in the science, in creating the practices, the ecology of practices, and, you know, in helping to create apps, uh, you know, consulting both with science, you know, scientific people and business people, or also governmental people. I, I, I'm trying, I, I, you know, and I've had to, I, the people at the Verveke Foundation have basically told me, and I've listened to them, I have to rein it in because I was trying to do everything everywhere all at once. <laughs> and as the movie showed, that's not a good idea. That's not a good strategy. Yeah. Um, but that's what you motivates You can do anything, not everything. Uh, pardon me. Uh, there's the, there's this quote. It's you can do anything, not everything. Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> uh, 
but I want to do everything because the meaning crisis is getting worse. And, uh, and this is a whole other argument I've made and I've made it on a video essay and in mentoring the machines, the book I released with Sean Coyne, the AGI is already, and is going to, it is going to be an accelerant of the meaning crisis and the virtual world already is an accelerant on the meaning crisis and the way those are already degrading uh, the political sphere in such pervasive and powerful ways. Uh, like I'm, I'm concerned. I'm really concerned. So you, you heard when I was talking about all the science and the philosophy and the practice, I'm all hopeful and optimistic because all of this convergence is taking place. But when we turn and we talk about the world, I get dark because I know that all that good is in a race with a lot of dark and you can and, see so it. That's, see a that's, shift in, yeah. And you can see it clearly. I mean, it's apparent from your facial fe expressions, from the your yeah. everything. Your mannerisms have changed, and, it, and it's clear. The book's coming out soon, September. You said twenty first, 29th. 29th. September twenty ninth. The first. It was the first half of the series. It's the historical argument, mm -hmm. and then the second half, the, which is the cognitive scientific argument, uh, will come out uh, the following year, I hope. Or what? Post, what, post what can people look out for for that? Because I'm pretty sure people are going to be very eager to. Add this to their cards. Yeah, it's my understanding the book is going to be available on Amazon as soon as we release it. You can look for the promotion of it. Um, you know, you can always go to my channel. There's a lot of videos on there. There's the two main courses, uh, Awake, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis after Socrates. There's all the cognitive science shows that I've done with Greg Enriquez on consciousness, the nature of the self, the nature of transformation, transcendent naturalism. They're all there. So there's my publications about relevance realization. They're, they're, that's all there. If people are want to follow that up, yeah, I mean, I, I can't, I can't wait, John. I'm, I'm, I'm super excited for it, and I can't wait to to read it, uh, explore it more. Any anything about consciousness, the mind body problem, uh, key takeaways from your lectures that people need to maybe take home regarding the mind body problem and consciousness that you feel that you haven't said, or even the meaning crisis as a whole, with its relation to our understanding of the mind and people and reality. Yeah, I would ask people to give more thought carefully in, con in conjunction with a more disciplined education to the way in which the issue of meaning in life is coming into their life and they might not be aware of it. There might be a general sense of malaise or things are just not right or the world is not making sense anymore. Things are more absurd. I feel more alienated. We know from the measures, people feel radically lonelier than they used to. The number of close friends they have is going down. Um, people feel the world is becoming more absurd, making less sense. Um, that's why they want to escape to the virtual world in which everything is clear, especially in video games, and they know how to level up. Um, and, you know, uh, you've a degree of alienation and the degree in which you're trying to make, because this is what the research shows, and this, this is... It's not wrong, but it's it's dangerous. You're trying to make your romantic relationships or your relationships with your friends and your family be the sole source of your meaning in life. Yeah. And yeah. while they are necessary parts of any meaningful life, human beings can't bear the burden that God and history um, used to and tradition used to bear. Right, they they can't do that. This is why romantic relationships are so much trouble. Our culture teaches us that they are. You will meet the one, which is drawn from Neoplatonism, by the way, and that one will totally save you and make your life totally redeemed and worth living, and the universe will celebrate it. And this is all bullshit, right? It's an evil bullshit. And and what and then of course on, that's on one side, and then you got the pornography on the other side, which is human beings should have no mystery to them; they should be just as sexually consumable as quickly and as easily as possible. And you get all of these weird, messed up expectations. And so, what do people think is the greatest source of meaning in life? Their romantic relationships. What is the thing that causes them the most sense of meaninglessness and despair? Their romantic relationships, and that's not a coincidence. So. Try to open up both your apprehension and appreciation of the problem 
and try to open up through education, responsible education, dialogue with other people, the avenues and the venues in through which you seek to achieve and participate in belonging, in meaning in life, in overcoming self-deception, in enhancing connectedness. Uh, oh, that's uh, John. It's a beautiful way to to end such a wonderful conversation. There's there's so many things that I'm looking forward to reading after this, and um, I, I'm very familiar with your work already. But getting to pick your brain personally is uh, has been an absolute clip pleasure and treats. Thank you so much. Well, you did an excellent job, Devin, at doing that, and you drew me out, and uh, you did that. You, you found the optimal grip between letting me speak and interrupting, and I appreciate that. It was really well done. Um, it, it's, it's my Tai Chi stance, getting ready to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> uh, th thank you very much. And I hope, I hope, uh, uh, you know, I, so selfishly, professionally i hope it interests people in my work i'm a scientist i i want to i don't want to i don't want to force my ideas i want to persuade other people of yeah. the value of uh, of my theoretical arguments uh, but i hope it also is it, it, it it's more broad i hope it enables and empowers people to do a, a richer and deeper kind of exploration of many other people many of whom we've mentioned yeah. uh, because uh um um, I think um, I think that would be to to many to a lot to many people's benefit. That's what, and I, and, I, and I do think that is happening, John. I think that is because from the people I've spoken to, many many pioneers in the field, the, uh, they often bring up your work, talk about it as well in very high regard. So I think there is a mutual respect there, and possibly an adopting approach that's going on. Uh, and it's cool to see as a spectator from the outside watching all you guys do this incredible work and and how they're all sort of coming together. It's it's very beautiful to watch. I I, I like I, I like that was an unexpected gift of doing all of this. Mm. Um, I I have actually come into more collaborative connection with academics than I ever did staying within the university system. Yeah, I, I'm not I'm not I'm not in any way criticizing the University of Toronto. It's treated me very well. Uh, but I just had somebody email me the other night who said I was watching some, one, one, of my, one of my academic friends who was watching after Socrates and I cited his book and he said, thank you for citing my book. And, you, and I started looking at your work and it's so important. And, and yeah. you know, and oh, that's ego gratifying and I'm not denying that. But it's also like a scientist, uh, you know, uh, needs other scientists yeah. to look at their work and inter you like you can't. You can't do science monologically. You have to do it dialogically. Exactly. I think uh, that's uh, Mike once sent me an email because he was watching an episode of Stephen Grossberg. Have, are you familiar with Stephen Grossberg's work by any chance? No, I'm not. Um, very, very cool as well. Um, from Boston University, Professor Grossberg. He's an emeritus professor. Um, Stephen Grossberg, S T E P H E N, Grossberg, G R O S S B E R G. Uh, um, I promise you, John, he is. He's, I think, is about eighty-five now, perhaps older, but this is amazing work. Mike was astonished by the fact that Grossberg remembered the, a conversation they had over thirty years ago. Which, <laughs> so he was watching the episode. Sends me this email to say that he can't believe that that he did that. And we were just talking about the fact that the, these podcasts, the fact that you guys make these videos online now, share them, provide so many scientists this opportunity, as you said, to discuss the ideas and for others to see it and witness it because. Even the audience would be surprised at how many professors send me e emails. Uh, I'm yeah. adding to this field. I'm, I'm just allowing you guys to promote your work. But it's amazing to see how much of them reach out to want to collaborate with you guys. And, and I try and just slot them email addresses whenever I can if I think it will be a mutually beneficial relationship. Well, I'm going to look at these two people you mentioned to me, Mark Solms and Stephen Grossberg. I think you'll absolutely uh, love both their work. Um, Stephen Grossberg, particularly with his neuroscience, uh, it's, 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 very, it's amazing. Yeah. And I'm so glad that uh, Michael is getting uh, a broader and I hope deeper audience. Uh, his work yeah. is Mike. Mike is he, he, first of all, he's just a really good person. Uh, yeah, that's a, uh, such a nice guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, the guy is titanically brilliant and there is no whiff of arrogance when you're talking to him. It's incredible. It's just like, like that. I, I admire that. Um, and, um, I'm I'm glad 
uh, Mike deserves to be more famous. I hope to the degree he wishes to be. I, th- uh, I think I think he he definitely will be at some point. I think it's, I, I think I, I think it's happening. Yeah, yeah, it's in the process. It seems to be um, uh, an inevitability of the universe. <laughs> Yeah, I think he he and Dennis Walsh are two of the people that are are revolutionary are revolutionizing biology right now, mm. uh, and we're we're gonna the, the general public is gonna know this like 10, 15 years down the road. Yeah, um, no, it's 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 absolutely astonishing. But look, he appreciates your work just as much. Just by the way. Well, I'm thank you, Mike. I'm glad to hear that. I I I, I surmise that from some of our interactions. And it's um, and it's obviously it's evident in his papers. I've got one right there, and it's got acknowledgement too. John Vivek, so he definitely does give you credit. Well, I appreciate that, and uh, uh, and uh, you know, and I, I know that Mike and I are going to be talking again at some point soon. Um, so I, I I appreciate it. I enjoy, I learn, I grow every time I talk with Mike. So I look, I you know, I yeah, it, it, that would be a recommendation. Like people go out, so maybe try the, the 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 videos first. I'm not being insulting. I'm just trying to onboard. Don't pick up one of his sort of nuts and bolts technical paper. Like you'll go, ah, what the heck? But do, do the discussions, do the videos, and then you can work your way into his really important work. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, I, I completely agree. Start off, start off a little basic and work your way up. But just like anybody who's going into any field, it's, it's what you have to do. Start with the basic. Yeah. John, thank you so much. I appreciate your time so much. It's been such a pleasure. Any, anything else you would like to add, John? No, Tevin, I just wanted to say thank you. It's been a great pleasure.